to 20 Minutes in the Text. I am Andrew. And I am Mason. And we are glad that you've joined us uh, here as we continue our discussion through the Epistle of James. Um, in my opinion, last week we we stumbled a little bit through... Yes, that's true. Uh, the um, understatement of the year. Yes. Uh, stumbled a little bit through one of the hardest sections in Scripture, really, to interpret yeah. and to understand. Um, and... We're going we're gonna to come out of that today. We're going to get into the next chapter of James. And uh, we're going to celebrate the fact that we survived last week. And hopefully you learned a little bit from last week. And if, you're, if you do have questions, concerns, send them our way. We'd be glad to address them as they come up here ahead. Um, but let's move along. And uh, Mason, before we get into it, uh, what's going on with you this week? Anything new? Anything exciting? Well, uh, the day that we filmed this, so... Not the day that this is released, but the day that we film. I um, taught my last class at Lutheran High. How about that? Happy summer! I know. Well, you. yes, uh, there's still grading of finals to do, but uh, yeah, it's just weird because you know, going into my first year of like being a teacher, you hear horror stories. Which I mean, I was a part-time teacher, so obviously I don't have the stress of being grading eight thousand papers. But still, it's sort of a can't believe it's right. Yeah, I, I can't believe you did either. <laughs> How about you? It's good. You know, we're just uh, living the dream. Got uh, trying to clean the house and keep things picked up. Got some fertilizer on my lawn. Well, what about understand. your kitchen? Um, we have some new tile and countertops, <laughs> um, which is good. Uh, social distancing with our installation of that. But yeah, right. um, we... we uh, had a trusted friend and neighbor help us with that this weekend, and that was wonderful. We we hacked off all of the backsplash and everything right before this all hit, and so um, put a lot of water on bare drywall the last uh, couple months. But um, finally, uh, looking good. Got the plumbing hooked back up, and maybe one day we'll be able to host a party and show it off to people. <laughs> but until then, my... Uh, at the end of a while, I asked about it. So, what do you like about the kitchen? Oh, it's good. All right. Well, <laughs> you heard it here. You like the cabinets? Oh, those are the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, but that's good. Uh, has nothing to do with the book of James, but uh, that's what's going on with us. Good to mark history. <laughs> it's good to mark <laughs> history, which is good. Um, but without further ado, let's dive into James chapter three, um, starting at verse one. And as I've tended to do the last couple times, uh, we're just going to read the first verse and we're yeah, going to stop there because he, he tends to just start off with it. He goes, goes in real hot and heavy. Yeah, yeah. He just hulks out a little bit here in verse 1. So um, if you're following along, feel free. Otherwise, James chapter 3, verse 1. He says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So let's, let's let that sink in for a minute. Uh, as, as teachers in the church... Yeah, I'm going to just say, I got no way for your teaching. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really prep at all. It was fine. It was fine. Um, it was fine. But, but here we are saying, James, talking to the people, uh, he's saying, hey, if you think about becoming a teacher, think again. You know, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, but yet a high call. Yeah. To teach in the church um, comes on there. So, so let's maybe pause there. If you're wondering, well, I'm a teacher, or I want to be a teacher, uh, or what kind of teacher? Yeah, I teach yoga at the place. I teach fitness at the place. Um, I teach at a high school or a preschool. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about maybe, let's say, specifically teachers in the church, um, what's the role there for, for teachers? Um, how, how do, who's he talking to? What's he talking about? You know, I think, thinking historic or in the uh, historical context of this, I, I think that he's addressing specific a, a specific office in the church, mm -hmm. teacher within the church. Okay, so there's that sort of. So as we have um, uh, pastor, as we have DCE, um, as we have missionary and, and deaconess, those are offices within the church. Um, teacher used to be the prominent office. Yeah. Um, that's just sort of have been swallowed up in. Right. So some were called. Uh, some were called to be apostles. Yes. Some right. were called to be 
teachers, mm-hmm. some are called presbyters, elders, yeah, all yeah, those yeah, kinds yeah. of things. And yeah. teacher is one of these <coughs> offices. Um, which is so, yeah. Which is an interesting thing about if you, I mean, it's a discussion for another day about um, what offices have we sort of combined into one. Yeah, so it's an interesting Absolutely. historical look. And um, would you say would you say that maybe this this role of teacher, as James is speaking, um, is something that in part has been assumed by this pastoral office as we have it today? Um, you know, in part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think but also know, we've, we've because I think you have out. like prophet, uh, teacher, apostle. You know, there's all these different distinctions, yeah. and now it's essentially those all got swallowed up into what we know as the pastoral office, and also the auxiliary offices as right. well. So it's just this, because you know apostles, the apostleship ended when the apostles, the last apostle passed away. Right. So who's going to pick up that gauntlet? Prophets. Um, Speak, not thinking of like, you know, um, I in 10 years, Andrew time. will be bald. Yeah. Um, I will, you won't. Um, yeah. Who's hoping? So it's sort of all prophet, more meaning like the spreading of the speaking yeah. of the word. Speaking of prophets, have you seen the meme um, about 2015? About how in hindsight, uh, what is it? In hindsight, uh, everybody in 2015 who was asked, where will you be in five years, was wrong. So uh, none of us were prophets because five years ago, none of us were saying, you know, I think we'll be in a four-month quarantine yeah. mm-hmm. for a global pandemic, <clears throat> making light of a terrible situation. That's what we're doing here. Uh, but da, 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 da. Yeah, it's what you have to do to survive something. <laughs> but back to the teachers. So yeah. why, why are these teachers going to be judged with greater strictness? What is it that they do? What yeah. is it about them that... that leads James to to give us this warning. Well, I think that, um, and this is sort of where it bridges the gap from the historical context to today, is that it's the reason why teachers, and it goes for sort of the historical Mm -hmm. understanding of teacher, but also teachers of the word today, and the many different offices and facets that we have in the church, it's specifically the message that they're teaching. Mm. So the reason why teachers are gonna be, as James says, judged more harshly, um, it's because if you mess up the gospel message, if you specifically, which is, which James and Paul does a lot, if you add to the gospel, that is, um, you're you're on a slippery slope into yes. a not a good place. Just to be clear, you're saying James and Paul speak about that. They don't add to the gospel. Correct. Okay. I just yeah, want to make James, sure uh, that you're yes. not being a heretic. No, 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 not right. Yeah. James and Paul yeah. speak about the dangers of adding to the gospel. Right. So okay. Being a teacher of the word. Is, yeah. You know. I mean, you and I, we have we have responsibilities. Yeah. God has called us to this place, mm-hmm. in this time, to teach the gospel, in many and various ways. Mm-hmm. And um, not only has God called us here, but Chapel of the Cross has said. We call you here to do this for our people, for yeah. our sons and our daughters and our parents and ourselves. Um, we're holding you responsible for delivering the gospel. Yeah, which and it's should should give you fail. a healthy fear. Yes, too. yes. I think that that is something. Please don't leave. By the way, yeah. he's like, "Where's the <laughs> door?" <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, that's something that I think all church workers should mm-hmm. really think about. Yeah. I mean, this isn't just like, I mean, I, man, I love studying theology. I love, you know, uh, talking about it, discussing it. But at the same time, like, this is, uh, this is, I'm going to make an example. I know this is not a dig at these people, but like teaching theology, if you, if you teach theology wrong, there's worse repercussions. Is that a correct word? Repercussions. Repercussions. Yikes. <laughs> um, uh, then let's say if I fail to teach someone how to correctly drive. Yes. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Right. Both, both matters of life and death. Yes, both matters of life and one death. One temporal death, one eternal death. Right. And that's Second the death. So like, you know, this, you know, uh, anybody who looks at church where thinks, oh, that looks fun. Like that, that yeah. looks like an easy job. Like, okay, well, yep. Yeah, and you also have this sort of divine responsibility on your shoulders. Right. You know, it's it's kind of tongue in cheek, but there's there's a little bit of a joke out there that if you're a uh, in in our case in the LCMS, a young man and you 
like the Bible, that you're a good candidate to be a pastor. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're a boy, you're yes. a, right. a young man, yeah. and you like you yeah. love Jesus and you like God's word. Well, you should become a pastor. Well, yeah. are you called to, to leading and teaching the gospel? And do you have those skills? And do you too? have those gifts? Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. the Holy Spirit absolutely equips the call. Yes. He doesn't call the equipped. Like Correct. we've been there. Yes. But there is there is this healthy fear and this responsibility to say the task of a pastor is A, B, and C. The yes. task of a DCE is A, B, and C. The task of a church worker is A, B, and C. Am I called to that? And am I capable of that? Because if I enter into it in a flippant way, Mason, yeah. I'm doing eternal harm. Yes. Right? Um, That's why I always, <laughs> when someone's like, well, I didn't, um, I just didn't like that, you know, sort of job I did in the real world, so I guess I, I just do ministry. Yeah. I go like, to church every week, I'll just do ministry. Well, I mean, there's, there's more to that. But it's interesting that you say that because of the fact that this isn't just a, a 21st century problem. Of just sort of, well, you have a beating heartbeat and you love the Bible, so you should, you know, go to church work, right? Um, Luther had a problem with this too, and I'll share this quote. I took a picture of it. But Luther had the same problem of sort of there are people who were not taking yes. the seriousness of this, right? Yes. And so he says this. Um, this is sort of in the midst of the conversation. He says, uh, I will pass over those whom bishops and heads of orders everywhere nowadays are promoting to the pulpit. Men who are utterly stupid and incompetent. <laughs> Classic Luther. Even if we should be willing to say that they are called and sent, we could not do so because incompetent and unworthy men are being called, and this comes from the wrath of God, who because of our sins is taking his word from us and is multiplying the number of empty talkers and garrulous chatterers. Wow. So in other words... Uh, Luther wants no part of those who are put in this place but have no competency to preach and teach. He wants no part of it. And he's very yeah. clear about that. Stupid and incompetent. And no, this has nothing to do with usurping the pastoral office or telling any of you to, you know, angry email your pastor. But <laughs> We're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> we all have that response. I yes. expect if I am failing in my call to teach the gospel. Yeah. To be competent in my in my skill and my my task and my profession, that those who I'm supposed to be teaching need to call me to account so that I can be better, yes. so that I can do what I need to do and not be turned over to an agent of wrath or um, you know be yeah. used by the devil in that way. Especially because at the end of the day, and we admitted this last time we were going through the tough text. You know, we have between us many years of studying theology. Yeah. And yet there are there is still so much we do not know. Yeah. And we, you know, we might have gone through some sort of education classes and have, you know, you've you've taught for longer than I have, and I just going back to this completely my first year. But that doesn't mean we're experts at teaching. Yeah. Right? There's always room to grow. In any other job in the world. Absolutely. But also in this one. Yeah. And you need uh, people to call you out on it. Um, well, this is the last thing I'll say because I know we're running out of time, but most humbling experiences I've had is when one of uh, our middle schoolers has been like, I don't think that that's right. <laughs> and then I look at him like, you know what? You're onto something. Like, oh yeah, yeah that's, that's, I've never thought about it that way. Right. You know, so it's, it's, they, they need, it's not that, oh, the, the pastor of the DC or the deaconess or yada, yada, yada has the degree. So they're just the almighty. Well, no. Yeah. Um, as we said at the seminary, Grandma Schmidt has read the Bible for longer than you have. So you should probably listen to some of her insights too. Yeah. So absolutely. Anywho. You know, education changes, the brain changes, psychology changes, but the gospel does not. And praise God for that. that uh, those who are called to teach are called to teach something very simply, that Christ has lived, Christ has died, and Christ lives again. Yeah. And uh, with that, we carry on to uh, verse 2 and beyond. Um, for we all stumble in many ways, James says, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. 
and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. It is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile, sea creature can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Go in peace, serve the Lord. <laughs> yeah, right? So uh, the tongue here, Mason, yeah. it's a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Right? Um, it's not the biggest body part no. in your makeup. No. And yet, um, it's one of the most powerful. Yes. Right. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't know uh, if, well, I'll share this. I know that we've had conversations that... Um, the words of others in your in your lifetime have laid on your ears in a hurtful way. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, growing up, I was not. I had very awkward middle school time. I was very small, very late bloomer. The words of others had a lot to say, uh, hurtful to me. Right, little Tom. <laughs> Sticks and stones will break your bones, and words actually will harm you. Yeah, right. Yeah, like they that's... absolutely will. Yeah. Um, but for the sake of time, let's, let's think about this fire, this world of righteousness, this restless evil full of deadly poison that resides in our mouths. Yeah. Mason, with this tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Mm -hmm. How does that sit on your conscience when you hear that? <clears throat> I mean, obviously it should sort of shake you a little bit, but I, I think I ultimately think about sort of, um, this is another Luther thing of the simul justus et peccator, is mm. the simultaneously sinner and saint, is the fact that in my life there's always this pull against the fact that my old Adam still creeps up every day, and yet my new Adam wants to, to, to do and speak the things of Jesus. Yeah. And so I think that like that's just our lives here on earth in this the, the sinful condition we're in, is that in these now purified bodies that we've gotten through the gift of baptism, we've been given the word to speak, and yet our sinful flesh still makes us speak different things and light fires that burn down for us. Yeah. yeah. It's um, it's it's like hitting being hit for me with a spiritual two by four when I hear yeah, something like for this. Sure. Yes. That um, I speak uh, the words of praise and I conf confess the creed and speak the Lord's Prayer and I, I do all these things to bless Lord our Father and I go home and I use my tongue to curse uh, those in my household that have been made in his image. Yeah. I use my tongue to curse uh, those in my workplace that have been made in God's image, who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, sure. who have heard the voice of God himself say, you are my own, you are chosen, you are forgiven. And I speak ill of them. Yeah. Um, but uh, is there any hope uh, regarding the tongue um, and the voice and the words of God for us uh, as we feel the, the burden of the law uh, and the way we use our tongue? Is there any hope for us? Yeah, just stop doing it. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> no, I think that, uh, no, I think that this is going to be a lifelong struggle. This is what I will say, is that... Um, as anything, and I know that sometimes Lutherans uh, sort of recoil at this, but in anything, you can grow in righteousness. You can sort of grow in your skill. Yeah. And so you can, you can grow in taming your tongue, just like you, you know, sort of break a horse with the, you know, with the bit in its mouth, uh, or you steer a ship. You can slowly but surely learn how to train yourself um, by, by the grace of God, the working of the Holy Spirit, to speak blessing and not curse. So I think it starts with the fact that confessing the fact that our tongues are sinful yeah, and then receiving the forgiveness. So we said that I was, was talking about this before we started filming, but um, 
every blessing that we re have received from Jesus, it's all been by his word, mm -hmm. right? So you're baptized into the name that's spoken. You're, you're given the Lord's Supper. That's the, the, the words of institution spoken over it, confession, absolution, preaching. It's all spoken. So Jesus's words are life-giving words. They actually do something. And then he gives us those life-giving words to go and speak to other people. So it's the, the, the Christian life, repentance and forgiveness, and then and going to speak life. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Mason, thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for watching. And uh, may God bless you as you uh, bridle your tongue, as you use that to speak words of blessing, not only to God, but out to those in your midst. We'll see you next time.